When you ask a little kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? They might say a NASA astronaut, a best-selling author, a TV star. Well, today's guest is all three. <laughs> and we are going to learn from him how to take our own moonshot, how to do the thing that defies the odds. Welcome to the Afford Anything podcast, the show that understands you can afford anything but not everything. Every choice that you make is a trade-off against something else. And that doesn't just apply to your money. That applies to your time, your focus, your energy, your effort, to any limited resource that you need to manage. So that opens up two questions. First, what matters most? And second, how do you make daily decisions accordingly? Answering those two questions is the ethos of this show. It's why we exist. And I am your host, Paula Pant, here to help facilitate that. Today, we are joined by former NASA astronaut, Mike Massimino. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome. No, thanks, thanks for having me. I really like that opening. Oh, thank you. I got you. inspired just listening to it. That's pretty good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I forgot to mention you were the, uh, the first rookie to spacewalk on the Hubble Space Telescope. I was. Uh, a rookie in that context, I, I'm assuming you were probably pretty qualified. Well, yeah, but uh, it actually, it's kind of like, you know, I, I teach at Columbia. We were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't call students freshmen any longer. They're, it's more first-year students, I guess. Is Oh, really? Is I call them freshmen. Freshmen? So it's like with them? rookies, if you, you know, if, like rookies, sometimes if you don't like that, you could just say first-time space flyers. But I like I like rookie. <laughs> rookie. And I like freshmen. I think it's, you only you know get to do that once, really, in life. So yeah. you should take advantage when you can. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Oh, and you were also the guy who brought Snoopy to space. I did. I brought uh, I brought my Snoopy. I used to play with them pretending I was Neil Armstrong and Snoopy was Buzz Aldrin. I had a, a, a costume that my mom converted an elephant costume. I was an elephant in the first grade play mm -hmm. with all the other kids that didn't have much talent. The summer <laughs> of 1969, that was converted to an astronaut costume that I wore in my, my toy Snoopy. Oh. Uh, I used to you know, have them everywhere with me when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, backyard adventures in space with Snoopy as a kid, I felt like when I was going to space for real, he had to come with me. So, so Snoopy was with me in space, and now he's at the uh, Charles Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa, California. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you uh, were shooting this the day before Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving yes. Eve. And yes. Tomorrow you're going to be holding Snoopy in the New York City uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade. That's the, yeah, that, that is the plan. I, I've made a lot of friends in my life in a lot of different cool, interesting places. <laughs> yeah. And Peanuts, yeah. the, uh, you know, the brand, uh, the, the uh, Charles Schultz uh, uh, Peanuts comic strip, of course, is where Snoopy and Red. So the Peanuts people are very nice people. And wow. they are headquartered in New York. I've gotten to meet uh, Charles Schultz's family, and they're wonderful people. And so they invited my wife and I to be a part of the parade, carrying Snoopy <laughs> in the parade. Who would have thunk it? So I'm very excited about that. As my wife would say, it sounds good in concept because you have to be there like 5 a.m. to go through balloon carrying training. So we'll see how that goes early on Thanksgiving morning. But no. uh, Well, you know, I want to kick this off. Given mm -hmm. that so many kids have mm -hmm. this dream of being an astronaut one day. No. I imagine a lot of the people who are watching this or mm -hmm. who are listening to this are kids with this dream. Mm -hmm. And so for the sake of all the kids out there who mm -hmm. are watching this, there are three questions okay. that I want to ask that are just <laughs> right. for the kids. Yes. All right, kids, tell, tell your parents to cover their ears. This, these next three questions are for you. All right. Question number one, mm -hmm. how do you fart in space? Yeah, I, I, think, I think the parents might want to listen to this too. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you more or less do most of your bodily functions the same way mm -hmm. uh, that you would do uh, on Earth, like you know, brush your teeth or, or as you say, pass gas or mm -hmm. go to the bathroom. All that stuff still works. It's just a little bit different. So, for example, if you've uh, been in an airplane, look at a bag of potato chips. You know, it expands in, in, in uh, it's, it's a lower mm, pressure yeah, when you go yeah. to altitude. It's approximately about 10,000 feet altitude when you're in the cabin altitude in an airplane, and so the air expands. When you're at a lower pressure situation, just like that bag of potato chips, your stomach also expands, mm. all right? So what that means is you have more gas in your stomach, and so you are encouraged to let it go. The gas in your stomach's gonna expand, you need to relieve it, or else that, that could cause you some uh, unnecessary pain and uh, discomfort. You don't want that. So it's important to do that. So you're actually more susceptible to it when you're at mm -hmm. altitude to, to gas. And when you actually let go, um, 
It works just like it does here on Earth. Oh, so you, does the, it stink up the spacesuit? Okay, so this, if you do it in your own spacesuit, yeah. you're going to smell it because you have your own. <laughs> so what happens is, is there's no, one interesting thing I think about space is there's no natural convection or motion of air. So on our planet, because of gravity, hot air rises mm -hmm. and then kind of comes down. We, we get this natural circulation of, of air. Yeah. We don't get that in, in space. Uh, in space, it kind of hangs around. So what we do is we have artificial circulation, like an air conditioning system, mm -hmm. where the air goes into a vent, gets cleaned from carbon dioxide and other contaminants, and then gets returned through a vent, right? That's how, that's how it works. Okay, so in, uh, in your own spacesuit, you're in your own little spaceship. So that air will be sucked in through, your, uh, through vents in your arms mm -hmm. that you're wearing this fancy pair of long underwear called the liquid cooling ventilation garment. And you didn't think this was going to be a technical answer, <laughs> did you? You thought it was going to be just for the kids. Anyway, you have these vents that suck uh -huh. in that air, and then it returns right over your head. Oh, no! So if you pass gas, uh, it'll come right, it'll it'll be sucked in, uh. right? That air will be sucked in because it's an artificial flow. You have a fan, that's that's, and it'll be returned right to your face. Ooh. It comes right over your face, and it comes out because you usually want fresh air coming in that way. Yeah. So you breathe nice, fresh oxygen. Oh. And it, it also does a little bit of... Um, like a like a defog of your visor, right? Just kind of right. like a so that's why it comes right and over your head, defogs a visor, and you get to breathe it. So, my friend Rick Linehan though came in from his, his spacewalk. He said I, was, I thought I was going to die of methane poison. <laughs> he he farted and it came right in over his head. The other thing that is that when I talked about that circulation, if uh -huh. you wanted to play a trick on one of your friends, let's yeah. say right, the uh, the way that that fan worked, it was uh, in the space shuttle the the circulation fan. It was right underneath. The, right next to the pilot seat in the upper part of the space shuttle on the flight deck. So we're down in the mid deck. If someone wanted to play a trick with, with this odor, um, they could pass gas right by that fan, right? Because ah. then that air would immediately be brought up to the, to the flight deck. And while that poor uh, pilot is sitting there, he might get a surprise. <laughs> Not that I would ever do anything like that. Not but if all. one wanted to, you could. <laughs> Current astronauts, take note. Yeah. Uh, to, to the grown-ups who are watching this on YouTube mm -hmm. or who are listening, uh, who are wondering, hey, wait, what, what does this have to do with me taking my moonshot? What does this have mm -hmm. to do with me getting where I want to go in life? Hold your horses. We're getting to that. <laughs> we still got two more questions oh, for the kids. Oh, goodness. All right. Two more for I'll the kids. I'll try to make it shorter. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so... The kids want to know. Uh huh. How do you pee in space? Yeah. Well, again, you pee the same way. Uh, one, one from the from the science or health part of it, uh, you tend to get a little more dehydrated in space. Mm -hmm. uh, your gravity keeps us the way we normally are, right? So our bodily fluid is included in that. And in space, when zero gravity, your bodily fluid tends to to go. It's not being held down by gravity to all your lower extremities and keeps everything balanced the way it's supposed to it can kind of pool in your upper body and your head gets a little full. You have like a bigger head, not because you're conceited that you're in space, yeah. but because there's more fluid there. Right. And it takes a couple of days. The brain figures all this out and redistributes it the way it should be, but you have the uh, tendency, the, the, the signal is sent to your brain, you have too much fluid and so you need to avoid pee. Mm. So you've got to drink a lot. You always want to remain hydrated. Very important on Earth, of course, but also in space. Very important so you don't get a an infection or you got to keep yourself hydrated. So you tend to pee more in, in space, especially the first couple of days. Uh, in, uh, in, on the space shuttle, which we don't fly the space shuttle anymore, but we would pee into a hose and that urine would get collected and then it would get dumped. The tank would, would fill up and then you would dump it out a port when no one was around outside the spaceship or ain't no space walking going on. And it was kind of cool because it, it was out, you, you're putting it out into a vacuum yeah. and it would kind of crystallize and disappear and the sun would shine through it. It'd be like a rainbow. Wow. It was kind of cool. So you literally, you dump your pee in Dump the, your pee. The pee's okay because the pee, the pee goes out there and it kind of disintegrates. It's, it's, it, the molecules kind of scatter, get excited, start to almost like they're boiling, poof, then they go. Wow. In a vacuum, it's kind of cool. That would be no really pressure fascinating in a vacuum. to watch. It is pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And on the space station, though, mm -hmm. uh, backing up a bit, on the shuttle, we, the power we had for the space shuttle was fuel cells, and fuel cells were liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and they would combine in a chemical reaction to provide power to charge our batteries. 
The, off, the, the byproduct of that hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen is liquid water, H2O. Right. So we had uh, plenty of drinking water on the space shuttle, so much so that uh, we, would, uh, we would have to dump some of the drinking water. So we couldn't drink all of it. That's how much we had, even though we were drinking all the time. Sounds a good way to go here but because you can create water, but it's a consumable. You start using that stuff, and you can only be in space for about you know, 17 days, and then you'll run out of power. So it's a limiting consumable, mm-hmm. that liquid hydrogen oxygen. On the space station, they, that wouldn't work, right? So what they do is they use the sun's power, and they have solar arrays for power. So they can't create water as easily. There are ways to do it, but you can't really create water like we did on the, spa- on the space shuttle. Right. So what they do is they recycle the water. So you pee into a tank, you pee into a hose, Mm -hmm. and that urine gets collected, along with all of your sweat, condensate, all this moisture in the air, all that stuff gets collected, and then it gets cleaned and treated, and you drink it again. So you're drinking your pee and your armpit sweat? Yes, but it doesn't, it doesn't, yes, exactly. But it it tastes just like, I've I've (laughs) had it, it's not bad, you don't know the difference, but it is kind of an interesting fact that you are drinking your own pee, but it's clean. It's not really pee. You're not drinking urine. I guess technically, are you not? Are you drinking only your own, or are you drinking? Everybody's mixed together. Oh, yeah. that's even But it's worse. treated and cleaned, and this is actually a, a pretty good spinoff for applications here around the planet because not all places. We're very lucky here in the U.S. Uh, that we, we typically wherever we are have clean drinking water. In mm-hmm. New York City, we have some of the best drinking water in the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, other places around the world aren't that uh, lucky to have clean water. It's a big problem. Right. So ways to recycle the water so or clean the water that is there um, is a good thing. And so that is something that was developed by NASA for space, but also can be used on the ground. Mm. All right. One more question. I want to talk about long, sh- you know, those long shot dreams, mm-hmm. how, how you developed the confidence to, to do something that kind of mm-hmm. seems like, I mean, everybody, every kid wants to be an astronaut, but, you know, who, who actually ever grows up to be an astronaut? Yeah. You. So mm-hmm. uh, I want to talk about that in just a moment. But first, first, we got that third question Another for question. the kids. Another question. Go ahead. Third and final question for the kids. The phrase, to infinity and beyond. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Buzz Lightyear, right? That's this thing from <laughs> yeah. Toy Story. Great, great series of movies. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, to me, it's just, I guess, kind of a cool saying. I never really said it, you know, I, maybe I should have used it more. And, but, uh, but I guess to me, it means, uh, you know, the, the, the sky's the limit. There really is no limit you know, there. You can go anywhere you want and that's where we're going to go and explore. Um, I never used that phrase really in practice, but, uh, I, to, to me, that's what it means that we're going to go and explore and there's no limit to what we can do. Mm, well, that's actually a perfect segue. Then, oh, cool. To um, to hearing about, you know, I want to hear about mm-hmm. your story and, and sort of take us scene by scene. You were inspired, I think, as many people mm-hmm. were, by watching the moon landing. Yeah. Tell us about that that day. Yeah, so uh, we're going back to 1969. July 20th was the day that Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon, the first person to do that. But the lead up to it, to me, was pretty exciting, too. I these are like the first memories I have of anything going on in the world. I was little, right? So I remember Apollo 8 in the Christmas time of 1968, uh, going to the moon, orbiting the moon, and coming back. And then Apollo 10, I remember, where they nearly landed. They went down with the lunar module into orbit like they had planned, and then they came back up to the command module. They did not land. Mm. And then that set them up for Apollo 11. And that build up to Apollo 11... Uh, that summer was was huge because we knew this was coming. School wasn't in session, but I went to my elementary school every day for a summer program, like a summer recreation program we had mm-hmm. at John Street School in Franklin Square, New York. And uh, that was all the talk about what was happening. It was very exciting. And uh, how, how old were you at this time? Six, almost mm-hmm. seven. So I, I was you know, six, almost seven. Yeah. And um, I, but I remember very clearly the uh, you know the teachers talking about it and. And my parents talking about it, and uh, this was the, this is how I was, I was discovering what the world was about. But it meant it meant a lot to everybody. But it meant something different to me. Um, I really uh, got into it as a little guy, and I remember very clearly thinking in the school auditorium when they wheeled in this. We were to watch the launch because the landing was at night, but the launch was a couple of days earlier during the day. And I remember they they wanted us to see it in this. This summer rec program, we took a, like a timeout from playing checkers and knock hockey or softball, whatever we were doing that day, and uh, 
and we all were in the in the school auditorium in my elementary school watching it on these small TV sets. Mm. But I was one of the little guys, so I got to be a front member looking up at this thing and thinking that this is the most important thing that's ever happened in the world for 500 years, and it's going to be the most important thing in the next 500 years, that people 500 years from now are going to remember this day. Mm. And it hit me like that. And those astronauts, Neil Armstrong, man, he was cool. He was the coolest guy and I you know, got to know him a bit, and I, I wasn't disappointed meeting him. He was just a good guy and uh, very much about the mission. But he was my hero. He was my idol, and I wanted to grow up to be him. So that's, that's what affected me. And seeing him, seeing him make those, take those steps on the moon, I was like, that's what I, I want to do that someday. That, that's what happened to me as a little kid. Mm, wow. How is it? So you know, as you grew up, did you hold on to that dream, or did you ultimately let it go? Nah, so what happened is that by the time I was about eight years old, mm -hmm. you know, you start growing up and uh, I, I realized I was, I, I was scared of a lot of things. Like I was not a thrill seeker. I still am not, believe mm -hmm. it or not. I, there's something, I'll take a risk if I think something's worthwhile, like going to space to fix the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm all, I'll do that. But mm -hmm. just for the heck of it, I'm not like a, I'm not a thrill seeker. My, my wife had a significant birthday a couple of years ago, and she, what she wanted to do was jump out of an airplane. And I was like, okay, go ahead. And she said, well, wouldn't it be great if we did it together? And I'm like, that would be so cool, but that is not happening. I will drive <laughs> you to the airport. I will take pictures. I'll even help flying the plane, but I ain't jumping out of it unless it's on fire. So she did that one with a friend of hers. They, you know, they did tandem jumps with, uh, with instructors. But I was, I don't, like, I, no, I'm not doing that. Um, and I was afraid of heights as a little kid. I was, you know, I didn't go fast on my bicycle. <laughs> I just was, I just was kind of like this cautious little guy and I couldn't see very well. I had bad eyesight at an early age and was kind of skinny and didn't, you know, didn't, I, I just didn't see myself growing up to be this superhero like Neil Armstrong. Plus, I mean, it's, as you say, it's, it's ridiculous. And I mm. think as I got older, I go, this is ridiculous. How many people grew up to be Neil Armstrong? No, nobody, you know, there's a handful and I don't see anyone walking around my neighborhood. So it just is something I just crossed off the list of possibilities. And it wasn't until um, I was a senior in college, I was studying engineering, but mm -hmm. I'm not, not thinking at all about the space program. I ne not even like working in the space. I was like, you know, it's just impossible. People, real people don't do that. My senior year, I went to see the movie, The Right Stuff, mm -hmm. which is about the original seven astronauts and the test pilots that came before them. And it depicted uh, in the book, I read the book by Tom Wolfe. I saw that movie and went and got the book right away and read the book cover to cover immediately. To me, what, what struck me about being those test pilots and the first, uh, the first uh, group of astronauts was the camaraderie and the teamwork and doing something of purpose that was uh, more than what, what you could do alone, being, being part of something that was bigger than you. There was things that I grew up with that didn't really seem like I was gonna be an astronaut, but. My parents, uh, both, both of them very smart people, good students in high school, never had a chance to go to college, but, but did things uh, for the community and in service to others and for the family. My father worked for the New York City Fire Department. He was a fire inspector. My mom was a, was a, a stay-at-home mom, and then when I was in college, she started working uh, at a senior center, you know, helping people in the community center there. And uh, I had the sense of doing something to make the world a better place in service. But also, especially I think with the fire department was doing something to help people it was kind of like a good thing, you know. And around me were police officers and, and firemen in my neighborhood, and the sense of community. Uh, I, I think that that affected me. That I wanted to be a part of something like that, and so that's what I saw in that movie and what I saw in that book, The Right Stuff. Um, being a being a part of something bigger than me, something that maybe not won't won't make you a lot of money, but that doesn't matter. I know this is what you, I know this is, this is about no, this making is, money. No, it's no, not. No, it's not okay. Not right. at all. But, this uh, is about having living. Right. Your best okay. Life. All right. Good. Good. Here you go. Living your best life. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you need money to live. You mm -hmm. know, but um, but I I've always felt like the true satisfaction and happiness comes from doing doing things for others. And I think what's interesting is that. I notice a lot of wealthy people donate a lot of their money. Mm -hmm. You know, they they like doing good things, but they do great things. A lot of generous people uh, who are able to donate. We all should donate, right? And right. I think that you could also do that in your job or in your work. And that's I wanted to be a part of that that sort of community, um, and I wanted to fly in space. I thought that looked pretty <laughs> cool too. So I, I started thinking about it and learned more about the space program. Now it's the mid 1980s when I got out of college, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I found out that it wasn't just military test pilots any longer. It was also um, engineers and scientists, and the first women women were picked for the 
for the space shuttle program. The first people of color were picked for the space shuttle program. Um, and I thought maybe this is something I could do. It's not just these military test pilots. There was just a little big part of it. Mm. But maybe I could at least throw my, my name in the ring. You mentioned confidence about trying to do things. I, I never for one moment, I think, thought I would become an astronaut. Mm. I, only, I, I felt like that was still out of reach. Even today, I, like, whenever I see one of my mission patches, I always check that my name is really on it. It's, it's bizarre. Like, I still can't believe it happened. But what, what, what I did decide I, I should do is try. Because you can control that. You can, con- you can control your effort. And I, didn't, I, did not, I knew these people were really well-qualified people and super, you know, superheroes to me mm-hmm. when I was a little boy. Um, to think I'd be one of them was kind of, I thought, ridiculous. But at least I could try to be a part of that team. Maybe mm-hmm. I could help them go. And maybe, but I knew I wanted to try mm-hmm. to be an astronaut. But I, so I never said, I'm going to be an astronaut. I, I don't think I've ever said that, ever. Um, I always said, I'm going to try mm-hmm. to be in it. Because I knew that is something that I could put my heart and soul into. And that's what I started to do. I worked for a couple of years after college and then went off to graduate school to, to pursue a, a career in the space program and maybe <laughs> be lucky enough to become an astronaut or at least try to become an astronaut. Mm. So you, you set the goal of not I'm going to do this, but I'm going to try. Yeah. But then on the road to trying, mm-hmm. you know, you went to MIT to get your PhD. Right. And then you failed your PhD qualifying exam. I did. I didn't just, I think I set a record for failure. Mm-hmm. I really was, it was terrible. What that exam was a bit different. It was very comprehensive over different engineering disciplines. And um, there was a written element to it, but there was also an oral exam where you got up in front of a wow. bunch of faculty members and they started asking you questions. And they're, you know, they're, they're trying to test you. I also always think that they're also trying to educate you, <laughs> you know, about what you don't know, maybe, you know, and, uh, uh, I got I got toasted I, I and I, I just you know, I got destroyed in the oral exam and I remember uh, when that happened uh, going to see my advisor Tom Sheridan who's still around I just exchanged email with him he's in his he's like ninety five years old now but he a uh, very good very good advisor and a good person he's like a father figure and I go in to see this guy and I knew it was going to be bad news because I knew it was obvious I didn't do well. and uh, went into Sam and uh, I said Tom I didn't pass did I and he says no Mike you didn't and I go, well, what do we do now? He goes, well, you know, you're typically offered a second chance, but we had a discussion, uh, the faculty did, on the committee, and we're not really sure it's worth your while to, to try again <laughs> because you did so poorly. We, you know, you get no, it's another try in six months, but it wasn't like you were close. You know, there's a, I don't know if you have six mm-hmm. months to, you know, get ready to, to change things, and you might want to think whether or not it's worth your while if you just, you know, take your master's degree and, and move on. And... And he goes, why don't you, you know, I go, well, can I think about it? And he's like, sure, yeah, why don't you let me know when you're ready to, whenever you decide. So I thought about it for a day or so, and then I went back to Sam, and I said, uh, you know, Tom, I'm going to give it another shot. What the heck? You know, I figured, what could I lose? If I fail again, I'm in the same position anyway. Right. And it was another semester at MIT, and as, as torturous as that place was, and still is, it is a wonderful place to be educated. Mm-hmm. And uh, another, another semester of taking classes and maybe doing some research and seeing if I could figure out how to pass this exam Seemed like a pretty good use of six months out of my life, as opposed to putting the tail between my legs and wondering what's next. So, uh, so he so he kind of smiled at me, which was interesting. And he he said, uh, in like this sort of academic MIT uh, words, he said, uh, you know, Mike, if uh, if one can learn to live with indignities in life, one can learn to go one can go far. If one can learn to live with indignities, one can go far in life. Something like that. And I was like. That's pretty cool. It's kind of like if you can get your butt kicked and get knocked down and, and learn how to live with that and get back up again, you can go far in life. And I, what, what I discovered was uh, is that I had prepared the wrong way. I wasn't just going to repeat exactly what I had done the first time or else I would have failed a second time. Um, but I started, I started reaching out to some of my friends who had passed the exam, and uh, they told me how they got ready. And how they got ready is they would help each other uh, prepare for the oral exam in particular because it's something we don't normally do. Mm-hmm. And so I put together a bit of a community. I, I talk about that a little bit in the book too. And I learned that lesson. I think it's important throughout life is that, you know, it's, it's nice to have a team, a mission control center, someone that can help you. And uh, so a group, I got a group of my friends together who had been successful in taking the exam. And on Fridays, 
I would supply like uh, cookies and juice, and we would go to one of the conference rooms, and uh, they would sit around the conference table and play professor, and I would play victim at the front, and uh, they would just grill me mercilessly. And it was a skill. It was an acquired skill to be able to think on your feet and answer questions. And it was pretty ugly at first, but it's better during practice than in the real day. And I got, I don't know if I got good at it, but I got good enough that when I took that exam again, I passed. So that was, that was something I learned that, uh, you know, there, when you're trying to do something, if you, when you're trying to make your moonshot, right? <laughs> when you're trying to do something that's out of the ordinary, and that, that doesn't have to be passing your qualifier at MIT or flying to space. It could just be anything. It could be learning how to drive a car. I, I also failed my driver's test the first time. I failed my, my, my private pilot's test the first time I took that. It just seems like anything you're trying to do that's new, if you're trying to learn something, if you're trying to do something with your family, if you're trying to accomplish something as a parent or something at work, mm. uh, if it's something that's challenging, mm. don't expect it to be easy. You know, there's a reason why things are hard. Not everybody does them, and uh, not everybody can do everything. And people that do, it's not like they're super talented, but they just stick to it, and they they try to try to forge on when when they get hit with difficulties. You know, success, successful people are not those that don't fail. That there's a there, there there are those that don't let failure stop them, and I think I learned that in school at an early age because it school was never easy for me. I tell my students that the hardest thing I've ever done in life is learn stuff in mm-hmm. school. It's not easy to go to school and learn stuff and take tests and everything. It's hard. So, um, but th- that's a lesson. Those are lessons that I learned on my way to becoming an astronaut. But it was also critical to keep up that attitude. I think once you get the uh, the opportunity, get the degree or whatever it is you're looking for, I think it's important to have that same attitude moving forward. As soon as you lose that that um, that attitude, you know, you think, oh, I've made it, now it's time to relax, you're done. Cash it in right there because as soon as you lose that, it's, it's not gonna go well. You need to keep that same persistence throughout life, I think, in order to be successful once you get the opportunity you want. Mm, I'm hearing the theme of uh, fail and try again, and yeah. I'm hearing the theme of take the long shot chance. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, we're talking about getting a PhD from MIT. It makes you sound very smart. But mm-hmm. your uh, fourth grade teacher would beg to differ. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mrs. Oko, uh, you've done your research. Did you <laughs> I, talk I to Mrs. Oko? <laughs> uh, oh, I should get a cameo from yeah, her. Yeah, there you go. No, yeah, Mrs. Oko, my, uh, yeah, my fourth grade teacher, was a very young teacher when I had her back in the fourth grade. She was like, mm-hmm. her, I think it was her first job. But I didn't know that until later because I was uh, reunited with her when I visited my elementary school. Uh, soon after I was selected, about a year and a half after I was picked by NASA, they were having a career day at the elementary school, and they asked me to come back. And I was like, sure, and it was great. They had decorated the school with all astronaut stuff. And I was like, th- like, I think I was like 34, 35 years old, so Mrs. Oko was still teaching. You know, she was still there, and, um, and I was able to have lunch with her. And she said uh, to me that uh, she was having breakfast with her kids. She had two boys, I think they're like 10 and 12 or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, she said, I'm gonna have lunch with one of my students that I had back in, you know, years ago, and he's an astronaut now. What do you think of that? And one of her boys said, wow, mom, he must have been really smart, right? Mm-hmm. And she said, I'm sure he was bright, but if he was really smart, I would have remembered. Like she remembered all the smart kids in the class. And I wasn't one of them. Right? I was just one of those guys, one of those young kids, in the, you know, looking around or whatever. You know. And uh, she, didn't, she didn't remember me in that way. But then she said, but I went on to tell them that being the smartest isn't always the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's having other things. It's being able to work as a team. It's sticking to it. It's not giving up. Um, and I had those things. And I think that makes up for a lot. And uh, I was never the. I wasn't the smartest kid. I can tell. You, I can tell you at least five five kids that were smarter than I was in Ms. Oko's class. Absolutely better than I was. And I was never the smartest kid anywhere in any class I ever took. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's probably a good place to be, you know, because <laughs> you can learn from others. You want to be challenged. Mm-hmm. But I had I had uh, these other things that that this realization that the the thing I wanted to do in life was to be not just flying space, but to be an astronaut, like in the lineage of my heroes, like. Neil Armstrong and John Glenn and those guys and and uh, Sally Ride and the ones that came later as well and to do that wasn't going to be easy and so these are things that I kind of discovered along the way that helped me um, get there and uh, not just get the job but that's kind of the beginning one in a million is not zero is the first chapter that the odds are against you do it anyway 
one out of a million is a non-zero outcome. As soon as you give up, that becomes zero, right? That one disappears and you know you won't be successful. But as long as you're trying, there's a chance. But the, most of the rest of the book are things that I learned as an astronaut um, to help me achieve that moonshot, but, uh, but can be applied to anything, mm. um, to personal relationships, to dealing with your family, parenting, I hope. Um, I try to use some of these principles. It doesn't always work, but, but I, think it, I think these are, it's kind of like a, a guidebook for, from things that I learned that can help you achieve whatever that thing is you're trying to do. Mm. I want to get to some of the lessons that you learned as an astronaut. Mm -hmm. I want to get to that in a moment, but first, on, mm -hmm. the, on the theme of what Mrs. Oko said, mm -hmm. you know, it's not smarts that matter, it's other things such mm -hmm. as working together as a team, mm -hmm. sticking to it, not giving up. Yeah. Uh, there were two things that nearly knocked you out of the running mm -hmm. when you became an astronaut mm -hmm. candidate. One was mm -hmm. your eyesight, Mm -hmm, the yeah. other was swimming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us about yeah. how you worked through both of those because they, they play to that theme of, of teamwork, sticking to it, not giving up, of everything Mrs. Oko said. So the, the eyesight issue was, uh, was during selection. The first, the first two times, NASA selects astronauts every couple of years. So the mm -hmm. first astronaut class that I applied to was the astronaut class in 1990. I applied. Waited to hear back. I got a letter saying, no, nah, no good. Um, I was like, all right, I'm going to try again. A couple years go by, the astronaut class in 1992. I applied for that. NASA reads my application. I hear nothing in for about nine months, and then I get a letter, no thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple years go by, astronaut class of uh, 1995 now at this point. Uh, I apply to that one. I get an interview. I get a phone call, not a letter, and they want me to come in for an interview. It's a whole week of stuff, including an eye exam. And, uh, and I met a lot of medical tests, and I failed the eye exam. I couldn't see well enough. And back then, they didn't, ex I don't know if LASIK existed, but they didn't accept any medical procedure. You were done. Mm -hmm. And once you're disqualified, they won't even read your application again. And that, to me, was kind of like horrifying. To, and, and for, for me, it was like, if they would have told me, now nah, we're going with these other people we like better or whatever, that's fine. You know, I can, I'll try again. But I couldn't even try again. It was saying that's it. And, the first time I was rejected, I was like, oh, I need more education. The second time was, oh, I need more, more experience. And the third time, when I got disqualified, I was like, well, I'm physically unfit. What am I going to do? I'm medically unqualified. And uh, I just figured it's gotta be, there's got to be some way to get back in this game here. And uh, I learned about uh, vision training. <laughs> there's a book that was called Seeing Without Glasses that I found in somewhere and ordered it. I don't even know if we had Amazon back then. But I ordered it somewhere and got this book. And... Um, and read it and found an optometrist that worked with the, these methods of trying to improve your vision. And when I went to see her, I'm sitting in the exam chair and she comes in, she's like, you're here for vision training? I'm like, yes, right? And Dr. Hopping, her name was Desiree Hopping out of Houston. And she says, well, I don't know if it's gonna work. How could you tell I just got here? And she said, well, I only work with kids. I've never done it with an adult. You know, kids, their eyes are still forming, their brain is whatever's going on there. And I don't think it'll work on an adult. And I said to her, well, I can be so immature, Dr. Hopping. You won't, you won't, you won't tell the difference between me and a 10-year-old. And I begged her. It was the only choice I had, and she helped me. And I was able to pick up a couple lines on the eye chart with these techniques and exercises and things to do. So I was able to at least requalify. And uh, that allowed me to submit my application again and then was given another chance. I got another interview for the next selection for the class of 96 and went into that, got through the eye exam. That wasn't an easy, but I got through it, and I got through all the rest of it, and the interview went well, and they, they, they picked me. Mm -hmm. So once I get picked, that second thing you mentioned came into play because you get a phone call from Dave Leitzma, the head of flight crew operations, he calls me up, and uh, he's, they were calling everybody that day, good or bad, uh, and uh, you know, he, said, <laughs> he said, Mike, how you doing today? He said, this is Dave Leitzma from the Johnson Space Center. I knew what he was calling about. And he said, uh, how you doing today? And he's like, Dave, I really don't know yet. You're going to have to tell me. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I hope you're doing well because we want you to be an astronaut. We, you know, we hope you're still interested. I'm like, yes, absolutely, yes. I hope yes. You're still There's no other word that's coming out of my mouth other than yes. And um, then I got a packet of info in the mail, uh, which I was very excited to open. And first paragraph was like, congratulations, welcome, or something like that. And the second one was... Uh, Please practice your swimming skills. And they gave us a whole list of stuff we were going to have to do. And it was, I think it was probably fairly reasonable for someone who was a strong swimmer. But the reason they warned us is because in the past they had, they had people show up. It's a naval course. It's a, it's a water survival course with the Navy. 
and uh, you have to be able to swim to do it. You can't drown during this because they'll teach you how to get you know into the water and parachute into the water and how to do stuff if the parachute's over your head. If how do you get into a raft? How do you survive? How do you signal? Everything's in the water. You're surviving in the water. It's not easy. So the idea is that we we're going to be flying in a, an ejection seat aircraft, and if you jump, if you pull the the, the rip cord on that, and you know the the handle on that, and you can, you, you eject out of the airplane, you're going to come down in a parachute, and it could be in the water, right? So you got to be able to know how to, to enter the water and do what you need to do so you don't drown before they can come get you. And the shuttle also had a bailout scenario. If you got stuck, if you weren't going to get it to space because you had a, 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 an emergency, a, something happened, a malfunction or lost an engine or whatever, it, you would try to turn back to the U.S. And, and land somewhere there. You needed a runway for the shuttle or try to make it over the ocean to the other side of the ocean in southern Europe and northern Africa. We had some sites there you could land. But if you couldn't do that, you were going in the water, right? So you had to bail out, and you might end up in the water, so you had to know how to survive in the water until somebody found you. So water survival is really important. We couldn't do any of our training until we started that. And you couldn't do the training, the water survival training, until you passed the swim test. So they had people, they would send them to, to Pensacola, and the Navy was afraid they were going to drown and sent them back. They would teach these people to swim. That's not our job. And uh, so NASA warned us about this. So I was... I practiced as hard as I could, but I avoided the water my whole life, really, and never really learned to swim very well. And um, I grew up in New York. We had bridges and tunnels and stuff. There's no reason to swim for it. Yeah. You know, we got here to Brooklyn over a bridge, you know, or you know, we didn't have to exactly. no, jump in now and get over there. No, you know, so. Uh, but now I needed to learn, and I did my best, but I was afraid about being embarrassed in front of my, my new classmates and um, all these high-performing people and military test pilots, and here's this you know, this egghead jumping in the water not knowing what he's doing, that was going to be me. But the Friday of our first week, after it was many administrative stuff, and that Friday, before we went home for the weekend, um, Jeff Ashby, who was uh, an astronaut in the class before us, and was a great leader, and was given the assignment of being responsible for all of us <laughs> to help us with our training, uh, he came in to address the class at the end of our first week, and he said, okay, uh, First week's done. We're done. And uh, But before you go home, I want to remind everyone that we're going to start our training in earnest next week. And Monday, we're going to start with the swim test. That's the first thing. It's like, can't we have a math quiz? Can we do something else? Why does it have to be that stupid math, uh, this stupid swim test? So anyway, so he, uh, he goes on to say, uh, who are the strong swimmers in this group? And there was 44 of us from eight different countries there. And uh, a couple people raised their hand that they were strong swimmers. And then he goes, all right. Uh, who are the weak swimmers in this group? And don't lie to me. So I raised my hand, and he said, okay, everyone else can go home, but the strong swimmers and the weak swimmers are going to stay uh, after class, and they're going to arrange a time to meet at a pool over the weekend. And the strong swimmers are going to help the, the weak swimmers with their swimming mm. because when we go to the pool on Monday, no one leaves the pool until everyone passes the test. Mm. And uh, that was uh, my indoctrination to this world I was now in. And I thought about that, and I've, I've thought about that not just then, but since, and during, while I was at NASA, what that really meant. What that meant was is that it's a team gamer in here, and you could be Michael Phelps and go in the water and set a world record in the pool, but if you didn't help your crew, if one of your crewmates failed, you also failed. Mm -hmm. That you can't do this alone. And in spaceflight, that is heightened because you are depending on each other to keep each other alive in case something goes wrong, and to be successful in your missions is too complex. But it's not just space flight. It's life is like that. Whether you're raising children or you're, you're working whatever job it is or you're trying to achieve your moonshot or dream or whatever it is, you really can't do this alone. And it's heightened in the space program because bad things can really happen to you. Right. Uh, but it's the same principle if you want to be successful, I think, in anything. The other thing that I thought was interesting about that, Paula, was that... Um, when you, he made us raise our hand that we were not strong swimmers, right? And I kind of did that sort of shyly, you know, that, yeah, I'm one of the weak guys here, right? But that was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. if, because if I didn't raise my hand and faked it and then went in there and totally bombed the test, it would not have been good for our group, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to raise your hand when you're having trouble, when you make a mistake, when you fail, uh, the thing that would get you in trouble was if you didn't admit that. And so um, that was the other part of it. And sometimes it's easy to think, oh, I'm going to help someone. You know, we, we got to make us feel good. We're helping somebody. But what happens when, you're, when you need help? You need to speak up. 
and uh, and help will be there for you. Mm, and that actually leads perfectly mm -hmm. to some of the lessons that you learned, mm -hmm. um, including uh, speaking up. So, yes. so tell us about Jim Kelly. Yeah, Vegas. Jim, yeah, yeah. The nick, who went by the nickname Vegas. Yep. Tell us about the time that you didn't speak up. So this is where I was a new person. I think for new people, a, a lot of times when you're in, new at something, or you're, and you're especially when you're working with somebody who's very experienced, we tend to not say anything. Mm -hmm. and it's okay if you're doing that to learn, but it's important for you to say things when you're the new person. And we were always encouraged to speak up because you're not kind of sucked into the usual way of doing things, and your, atten your antenna might be up a little bit more. And that goes for a new idea, something that might be a problem, identifying it with a different perspective. And a lot of the ideas or the, the things you speak up about may not make any sense and might not be good, but every once in a while you'll come up with something that might be important and you should make sure that you vocalize everything and leadership should be there to listen and encourage it and not squash someone speaking up. So that was our culture. Um, and one of, the, one of the ways I learned this in a practical way was flying with Vegas, my buddy Jim Kelly, and it was one of my first flights. I probably had two hours, you know, maybe two flights in the airplane, the T-38. Vegas had thousands of hours. He was a military pilot, flew combat mm. in the Air Force, flew F-16s. Yeah. You said 3,800 hours. 3,800 hours, yeah. yeah. He was an F-15 pilot, flew the Eagle, everybody's saying. And uh, yeah, 30, okay, that number's correct then. 3,800 hours in high performance jets as a combat pilot and as a test pilot. He was one of the best pilots. He was a young guy too. He was, he was I think he might have, my age or maybe younger. We were kind of on the young side. So he had accumulated all this in a fairly short amount of time. Mm. And uh, great guy, you know, wonderful personality, good friend, still is. And uh, we get in the airplane and he's, we were going flying together. It was going to be a, a, a out and back. We were going to go to San Antonio, hang out for a little bit, and then come back at night because he, he needed to get nighttime mm -hmm. as part of the deal. He needed to get a night flight in. So he went there toward at the end of our day. You know, it was a great flight out there. We were talking and he's teaching me stuff and it was great. And then it becomes nighttime. And at nighttime, I think just in general, it just gets, you're, it gets not scary, but you just don't see what's going on you know, as well as you did in the daytime. And right. you, gotta, you're, you gotta be more vigilant at things, you know, just in general. Walking around town, driving a car, whatever you're doing, Nighttime, I think, is you need a heightened awareness because you don't see as well and you're kind of tired and, you know, it's the end of the day or whatever. So we're ready to come back and we get a clearance. And my job was to kind of write stuff down and put it in the flight computer. And the tower gave us a heading out of, uh, out of El Paso. They go, your initial heading, say it was like one, maybe 180 was going to be our initial heading. So I write that down and put it in, a, a, in the flight computer. And we taxi to the runway now. So there's a few minutes between being at the base ops going through the taxiways, it's through this field, and then getting out to the runway. And by the time we got to the runway, and we got our true final clearance from this guy, it's like cleared for takeoff, turn one, 360, a different heading than what we had, than the initial, you know, climb to 10,000, cleared for takeoff. So I changed the heading. And as we're rolling down the runway, he lights the afterburner, and we get off the ground, and he raises the gear. We're going really fast, and he starts turning toward the old heading of 180. And I see him doing this, and I know that the guy just said 360, and I put that in the computer, and I'm like, what the hell do I know? I don't want to say. I mean, this guy is this, like one of the greatest pilots in our country. I don't even know how to get inside of the airplane you know, without help. I guess he knows what he's doing. I'm just going to shut up. Well, a few seconds after that, the tower comes over, the, the comm, uh, the, you know, the, over the, the radio and says, you know, NASA 911, turn right now, hard right now. So Vegas takes the airplane and zips it to, makes his hard right bank. And he's like, what the hell was that? Uh, what had happened was, is that another aircraft had showed up mm. in, the, in the time that we took to get to the runway. And we were headed toward that aircraft with that initial heading. We almost had a midair with another airplane. A midair collision? Yeah, because we were headed. He was coming in, and we were headed right toward him with that old heading. That's why mm -hmm. they changed the heading, and that's why this this controller, the tower guy, came on and right, you know, immediate. And it's rare that they'll scare you like that, but it's time to go. So he made this quick turn, and we avoided the the other aircraft. But he was like, "Holy cow!" He goes, "What was that all about?" He goes, "Did he change our heading?" You know that. What? And I go. Yeah, it's, it's right there in the flight computer. He goes, he's like, you heard him change it. 
you saw me go in the wrong direction and you didn't say anything. Now, I can't see him. I can only see the back of his head because the aircraft was a front and back. So you have the, mm -hmm. the, the pilot and commander's in front. I'm behind him. I can see the back of his head. I can't see his face, but I can hear him. And he's like, you, didn't, you knew that and you saw me do that. And you didn't say anything. And, and I was like, no, I, I thought you knew what you were doing. That's <laughs> what so I said to this guy. That was it. There was no more conversation. There was no, no chit chat, no what's going on with the football game this weekend, nothing. We came back and we just communicated to, to, complete the, to complete the mission, complete that flight. And when we landed, we get out of the jet, I get down the ladder and I was like, okay, maybe, maybe we won't be talking about this, hopefully. I get out of the ladder and now I, he's right in my face. Not in a mean way at all. Mm. You know, it's, my, it's still my buddy, he's still my colleague, and he just says, Mass, one thing you need. Before, he let, before we got out of the air, you know, right next to the airplane, this could not wait until after we took a pee. It was gonna be like right now. Uh, he's like, Mass, number one thing you have to learn from tonight is that when you see something, you need to speak up. Um, we almost got killed tonight because I went in the wrong direction, and that's on me. And he said, that's my bad. But you didn't speak up, and that almost got us killed as well. You almost got us killed for not speaking up, and you can't ever do that again. Speak up. When you, even if you're, if you're wrong, I will tell you you're wrong, but I will always thank you for speaking up. You have to speak up. And he was being really serious about this because we got away with one, and maybe next time I'd be with someone else and we wouldn't. And... Uh, I got that message loud and clear. And then that, I think, is a good lesson for everyone to hear. You may not, may not be life-threatening, but it's important to speak up. If it's, you know, it could be something that deals with the product that you're making or the company you're working for or whatever you're trying to accomplish, and you're a new person coming in there, and you're seeing something that doesn't seem quite right, and everyone else has already assimilated this into, you know, that this is going to be normal. I don't know. Maybe one out of a thousand times the guy changes your heading on the runway you know it's really rare that that happens as i turned out the guy you know they're not making this stuff up there's a reason why you're going in that direction and it's rare that they'll change it at the last second and maybe me as a new guy i'm actually paying attention the whole time and vegas is like all right i heard one eight zero ten minutes you know five minutes ago it hasn't changed so uh so you don't know why and, and you need to speak up when those things happen and that was a lesson i learned and put into practice from then on. I got away with it <laughs> mm. uh, the first time, and I was never going to let that happen again. Oh. Wow. So a couple of lessons. One, mm -hmm. one is that lesson of, uh, of take the long shot, try. Yeah. One is the lesson of teamwork. Nobody, nobody, gets, nobody leaves the swimming pool nope. until we all pass. Yep. And then another is that lesson of speak up, yeah. otherwise you might have a midair collision. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, you also... Uh, learn the lesson about the importance of trust, mm -hmm. trusting yourself, mm -hmm. trusting your training, trusting your team, trusting your gear, mm -hmm. to uh, kind of talk about this. Mm -hmm. Tell us about February 1st, 2003. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was uh, when we lost the, the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, Space Shuttle and crew. And uh, that, was a bad, that was a bad day. It was the worst day of my life. Uh, Pretty much. Uh, we, where where yeah. were you when you got the news? Oh, I was, uh, so uh, that morning, that Saturday, uh, I was with my, my son. Dan, uh, Daniel was, how old was he? He was seven years old. So we were at the uh, Cub Scout uh, Pinewood Derby race that morning. We were heading into the, into the school for that race, into his elementary school. And uh, one of the parents saw me and he says, uh, have you heard anything? I'm like, heard anything about what? And he said, he said, to Daniel, he goes, Daniel, why don't you go inside? Your dad will meet you. And I said, so what happened? He goes, they lost the shuttle, they think. They lost communication. So I immediately called my friend Steve Smith and uh, on the phone. I think it was the only number I knew by heart because it was back then. I, I, I don't know what kind of cell phones we had, but but I called Steve up, and I was like, uh, he's like, what's going on, Mike? I go, turn your TV on, a CNN or something like that, and see what you, tell me what you're looking at. And he's he's looking, and he's like, and he started, you know, like saying things I can't really say on your air, like, you know, like, holy cow, right? And I go, he goes, I, he goes, it does, doesn't look good here. And I go, what do we do? He goes, he goes, go to work. We, we all got to go into, we got to go to the office. And so that's what we did. We all congregated there. And what had happened is that we lost the shuttle. They had taken damage on Ascent when they launched. We didn't know, no one knew that. I mean, they knew they got hit by a piece of deb debris, but it put a hole in the wing and uh, that we weren't aware of and, and uh, the crew wasn't aware of. There's no way to inspect the vehicle, and they couldn't repair it even if there was. And it, and it, it's like one of these things you do it a thousand times and it's okay, and then a thousand and one it's not. And 
the external tank of the shuttle debris had been flying off of it and and hitting the, the space shuttle it's a big the big tank where the fuel was mm -hmm. for the for the main engines and uh it had never caused a problem before so like ah, it's probably okay but it wasn't this time this was the the one time when it wasn't and uh so when they tried to re-enter they had a hole in the spaceship that they didn't know about and when you come in and slow down in the friction in the atmosphere it builds up a lot of heat like 5,000 degrees worth of heat and that entered the wing and took it off and we lost the shuttle and the crew so that's what ended up we found in the investigation and uh did you leave your son at the cub scout thing yeah i did i got one of the parents to watch him mm. and i said yeah i gotta go mm. and, and you figured out what was work. going on went into work found out what was happening and it was really chaotic uh mm. but uh the first thing that we needed to do was take care of the families because they were coming back from the cape and i knew them really well so i went to meet them and see what i could do to help with them and and uh, and people did different things. Whatever they, whatever you know, everyone had assignment to do that day and, and moving forward. Um, and then we had to figure out how we were going to fly the spaceship again. Was the other thing and how we were going to build up that trust. Because when you do things, when you mention trust, um, when you do something that's kind of scary, uh, the only way I found I could do that was to to trust different things. Trust the gear that I was going to work with. The, the space shuttle is going to work. Trust my training. A lot of times we think that we're not ready for something, but you're not. You're not set up for failure when you're given an assignment. You have to trust whatever got you there. Your name wasn't picked out of a hat. That was a tough one for me to to, to learn that, no, I am ready to fly in space. Or else they wouldn't let me. You know, they're not doing this because mm -hmm. I won a contest. I, you know, I'm, I'm the person <laughs> that's supposed to do this. Willy Wonka. Yeah, right, exactly. I didn't pick, you know, my name wasn't picked out of a hat here, you know, so. Um, but that's something I think we need to remember, no matter what it is, when we're scared about stuff or nervous about things, mm. and, and entrust your team, and, in, and trust yourself as well. Your team is with you, and trust yourself to execute the plan, and, and so it was a lot of trust, and all of a sudden, like, well, how do we trust anything anymore, because this thing's gone? And the way we rebuilt that trust was by doing a thorough investigation, where nothing was covered up, everything was honestly exposed. We all felt like complete idiots, because there were things that we had thought were safe that weren't, and uh, not even you know, not even what happened with that with that debris, but even the way we approached entry, of how the importance of we, we thought entry was easy. We we were worried about on ascent. That's where you lost people. That's where things blow up with the engine running. Mm -hmm. Coming back from a space mission on the shuttle, there's no there's no fuel left. You're just gliding back. I mean, you first have to use your engines to maneuver, but after that, it's a glider coming home, and there's no fire there. You know, there's no active fuel there. What could happen? And that's what happened, and it made us all feel like idiots. So there was plenty of blame to go around. Um, but what got re restored the trust was how everyone reacted to it. No one was trying to cover it up. No one was saying it's that person's fault, not mine. Everyone was was fully engaged with trying to find out what had happened and making sure it wasn't going to go again. And so the next flight, we were the first flight up there, we were pretty sure that was going to work well and that we were going to be able to uh, fly out the program safely, and we did. So we, we had to rebuild that trust. So trust allows you to do things. Sometimes things don't go well, um, but it's no time to point fingers and throw people under the bus. And I'm really proud the way that we reacted to it. We came together as a team. You find out what your team is like when you, when you experience disappointment, tragedy, bad times. When things are going well, you high five, everything's great. But what happens when things don't go well? Do you, do you retreat? Do you give up? Do you say it's your fault, not mine? Or do you come together to fix the problem? And that's what we did. And I, I'm really proud. I, I would never want to go through that accident again, but I'm really proud of the way we reacted to it mm -hmm. to, to get flying again. What advice would you have for anyone who's listening to this who's having a hard time trusting, either trusting their team or mm -hmm. trusting themselves? Yeah. I, I, think, um, I, I think you have to, you have to, for me what it was, is have to believe that uh, if you can't trust yourself, that's not good. So... Put, look at your trust in other areas. Like, I would trust, for the space shuttle, I was nervous at first, you know, going on the space shuttle. The, the thing that gave me the courage to, to do that, it's kind of scary looking up at the spaceship when the, time, when the day comes, arrives, like, ooh, this looks kind of scary. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Mm -hmm. But I just thought that uh, this, this spaceship's ready to go. A lot of people have checked it. I'm going to trust that machine. I'm going to trust my spacesuit when I'm spacewalking. I'm going to trust my tools, my tether. And I'm going to trust my training. Uh, you know, for me, I felt the reason I, I was kind of worried um, going into my first flight was I felt I wasn't ready. How do I know if I'm ready? I've never flown in space before. But I was pulled aside. I think people could suspect that. And I think it's, it's pretty common. Um, but I was pulled aside to be, to be told that, you know, we have full confidence in you. You've shown that you're fully capable and you're not really a rookie. 
is what I was told. You're, you're ready to go just like any of the veterans. And I knew I needed to accept that. You have to accept that because you have to do your job and you have to have the trust that you are ready to go or else it could affect your performance and could mess up the whole thing. So you want to have trust that you're trained well and, and you're trained and ready to execute the plan. How do you square that, though, with those moments that I think mm -hmm. all of us inevitably face when we disappoint ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, I want to trust myself, but I once completely got tangled up in my tether. That's what happens you know? to me. Yep. Right. Yeah. At the, uh, at the, in, where were you? The International Space Station. And you like. Uh, oh, we were practicing there. Yeah, oh, we were pra that was a practice run oh, good, right, good, with good. the tether <laughs> snarl happened. It never happened in orbit, luckily. But uh, yeah, for things like that, when you mess things up, I think that it's, it, you're going to make mistakes and no one wants to make mistakes. So the issue, I think, is learning how to, to deal with those mistakes. So um, when, when, you, when you do make a mistake, uh, it's okay to be disappointed in yourself, but you have to cap it. Give yourself 30 seconds of regret, beat yourself up internally. Man, that was the dumbest mistake I've ever made. I can't believe I've done, I'm the stupidest astronaut ever, or whatever it might be. And after 30 seconds, let it go and move on and, and don't repeat that mistake. Try not to repeat it, but, f but leave it in the past and move forward. Don't dwell on it because if you dwell on your mistakes, you're, just, you're, just in, you're living in misery and it, you're, you're not going to be a, a functioning person. At least that's the way I was. Before I learned how to deal with my mistakes, I would ruminate over them, mm. sometimes for days. Oh, I can't believe I did that. When I failed my qualifying exam, it's like a week of misery, you know, more was me. That's not helpful. That week goes by, you don't get those days back in life. They're gone. So you need to figure out a way to leave it in the past. But I do think it's okay to be mad at yourself and to be regretful and remorseful and call yourself an idiot. But keep it to 30 seconds and just get rid of it and then let's move on and, and, and move forward. And then the other thing, when you make a mistake, what I learned with that tether snarl, uh, because I, I got myself tangled in my tether, and at first it wasn't so bad. My, so the tether's there to keep you so you don't float off into the sun and become a satellite. And you know, something happens. <laughs> Very Earth. important. Yeah. Really important piece mm -hmm. of equipment. But it's also a hazard because it's, 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 it's this wire that's always with you. And so you can get wrapped around your legs, which is what happened to me. And that's fairly common, especially when you're learning. But I didn't want anyone to notice. So I'm like, okay, let me try to fix this on my own. And maybe one, no one will ever notice or, or my training this was. The next thing you know, it's like going around my back, down my backpack, around my head, and I, there's no way I'm getting this thing out, and mm. I had created a really bad problem, and so that's where I learned this, what we call Hoot's Law. It's, Hoot Gibson came up with this. Hoot uh, was a former chief of the astronaut office and a very talented pilot, and uh, his motto, Hoot's Law, was you can always make it worse. No matter how bad you've messed up, you need to remember, you can make it worse, and Oftentimes we make a mistake and we're like, oh man, that's, I'm going to make up for it. No one will notice. I'm going to rush now. And no, 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 no. Just take a beat here and don't make it worse. And you can actually think about how I can make this worse. Like in the tether situation, okay, I've got this snarl around my leg. If I move too quickly and I don't get help and I make it worse, then the snarl is going to be around my head or I'm going to somehow damage my tether or my spacesuit, or I'm going to lose something or I'm going to lose, you know, let's not let any of that happen. Let's just deal with this problem. Let's recruit help. Let's get a second set of eyes on it. Let's slow down and take it easy for a minute here before we make things worse. And those are my two reactions. Whenever I made mistakes, it was, all right, I'm going to give myself, it's okay to be feel upset with myself, but I'm going to cap it at 30 seconds and then work toward the solution, not wallow in the misery. And I'm not going to make this worse. I'm not going to create a problem B for us to fix before we can get back to problem A, because problem A is bad enough. Mm. Right. And so in order to, to take that beat, you've got a mm -hmm. saying, it's, it's go slow like Joe Lo Piccolo. <laughs> so Joe Lo Piccolo was a family friend mm -hmm. who, uh, uh, who would fix, could fix anything because he went slow. Mm -hmm. He took his time and could fix anything. And uh, he was famous for this. So he would take a long time, but he wouldn't break anything. If something did break something, he would slow down even more. When I got to NASA, I would hear this as well, go slow, slow down, especially when you make a mistake. You go slow to speed up. You know, the idea was don't rush. Don't do something you're going to regret. Take your time. Get a second set of eyes, you know, especially when something goes wrong. You know, just, and so they kept saying, go slow. And I blurted out one time in our training, uh, and after we were getting debriefed, I was like, I mean, go slow like Joe LaPiccolo. I couldn't help myself any longer. 
And they go, what? And they explain the story, and it became like a theme. They go, it's exactly right. And Joel Piccolo became somewhat of a celebrity uh, in our training team. So, But yes, go go slow. Think of Joel Piccolo when something goes wrong. And how do you square that? You know, with something something like spacewalking, the mm-hmm. goal, as I understand it, is to shave minutes off of yep. the spacewalk. Right. So how do you square, hey, here's this thing that, we want it, that we're doing, mm-hmm. where we want to shave minutes mm-hmm. off of the length of time yep. that we're doing it. How do you square that with going slow? I don't know if it's the story of the hare and the tortoise, you know, the steady, mm. the slow and steady wins the race. But what we found, um, remarkably enough, was that if you, if you try to speed up by moving more quickly, I mean, sometimes you have to make haste. If you're being chased, now, you know, if, you know if, if, uh, if you're being chased by something or whatever, you know, you got to run, you got to go, right? But and you can't really think about it. I don't know if that even makes sense if you're being... You know, if uh, if a if a wild dog is after you, you might want to not. I'm going to go slow here, man. That's not. There are maybe times we need to go quickly, but um, what we found in in what was uh, what I was taught uh, in in this world that I entered at NASA, and what I discovered on my own is that what what we really mean is move with purpose, think before you act. Um, if a, one bad mistake can cost you ten times what uh the amount of time of of what you what you do by going slow and when we were especially for things that had a high consequence or that you could make an error particularly maybe when you're fatigued toward the end of the day or when there's high pressure or whatever it might be that's going on that's the time to take a beat and go slowly because if you rush to do something you might do something incorrectly make a mistake break something that's going to set you back a lot more than just a couple seconds. Mm. And so it was, it's just as you're saying, my first reaction was, ah, that's nonsense. You got to move quickly. You don't save time by going, trying to go fast. You save time actually by go, trying to go slow and deliberate and, and executing at the right pace. Because once you start rushing, that's when you start missing, missing things. And in the work we were doing, you couldn't afford to miss things or miss a step because you're going ha- to pay for that later. So as, as counterintuitive as that might be, uh, slow and steady does win the race. And I think that that's the way it is with most things. Once we start rushing, like especially if we're, in a, if we're driving in a car and we're yeah. trying to rush, <clears throat> that doesn't work. That's when you start making wrong turns. God forbid you get in an accident, but now all of a sudden you're in the wrong street and like, oh man, I, I was rushing to get there and now I don't know where I am. And now you just lost 10 minutes because you're, you're in a hurry and now you don't want to do anything that might slow you down even longer by doing something with the with the with the car or god forbid getting in an accident or whatever it might be that's the time to slow down and we tend to feel rushed at things but we've got to be really careful of uh, of taking it too fast because that's where you could start making mistakes that you'll regret and i think that goes to decision making and sending out that email that you might regret sending out you know don't don't be quick to the draw here you know let's let's take a beat when something goes wrong or when we're not feeling good about stuff just give it a moment and recruit some help. Slow down. It'll save you time in the end. Mm. So we've talked about the importance of teamwork. We've talked about uh, taking the the long shot, the mm-hmm. moon shot try. We've talked about the importance of speaking up, mm-hmm. about the importance of trusting your team and yourself, mm-hmm. uh, the importance of going slow. Mm-hmm. The, the last uh, lesson of, of the many yep. that you outline, mm-hmm. um, the last lesson that I want to cover mm-hmm. is... The importance of staying amazed. Yeah. Um, why? Why? Sometimes you can get bogged down in the details of, of your life. And even as an astronaut, as exciting as that sounds, it was a job. Mm-hmm. It really was. It, it was uh, a lot of hard training and working hard and things that were sometimes scary and dangerous and time away from home and missed holidays. We're coming up on Thanksgiving. I missed more than one, one Thanksgiving with my family because I was – Doing something at work that I need that that I needed to do, uh, working in a control center, working shifts for flights that were up. Um, it's it's not a you know it's not always a bowl of cherries, and I think that uh, that's the way it is for most of us. Even you know we think that some sometimes there are glamorous jobs out there. A job is a job, <laughs> and I think there's always those good elements, and there's always that those tough parts to it too. And I think we need to take time out to remember how amazing it is that we're here in the first place. And it hit me on on uh, on my very first space flight, on my second spacewalk, looking at our planet and realizing how beautiful it is from that perspective. And it's it's still beautiful down here on Earth. It's in fact it's more beautiful engaging it 
on earth, but you don't see it in its full glory unless you're in space, I think. I think it was meant to be seen from space, and you see this beautiful place that I thought looked like heaven to me. It, I can't imagine any place being more beautiful than our planet. And But you can't go to space all the time to see it. I can't, but I can engage it here on earth. I can see the beauty of of if you're out in a remote area of the mountains or the ocean or the clouds above you or the stars at night, but even in the city, just the buildings around us, the faces of people in the subway, if we're riding around New York City, there's a certain tempo to it. There's a beauty to it. It's amazing that we're all here. It's it's a very fragile place we have, our planet. Our, our atmosphere is, is very thin. You see that in space. If you look at a picture, it's just a thin blue line above the planet. If you think of the Earth as an onion, the top thin layer of the onion is the size relationship between the atmosphere and the rest of our planet. And we've checked out the neighborhood. We've got nowhere else to go. We have to make this planet work. Uh, we have to take care of it. And it's, it's amazing that we're here. It's been here for a long time. Going through a sunrise in space, you go from darkness into sunlight. And if you look out, I was on one of my spacewalks, looking down at the planet, you see the line that separates night and day. Then on the left, it's dark. On the right side, it's light. And there's a very distinct line that we call it the Terminator that separates that. And that line is moving across our planet. It's moving across our planet right now. But we don't think of it that way because we see the sun rising in the morning or going down at night if we're lucky to, to catch that. That's not what's really happening. It's our planet is rotating toward the sun and or away from it, depending on where you are. And so we see that line moving, and I could see the rotation of our planet and it's a very steady motion. And I got the sense of permanence was the word that came to my, to my mind because it's, it's been going on for billions of years and it's going to go on for much longer. Billions of years after each one of us who are alive today are gone. It's gonna, we, our time is now to be a part of this. And our, I think we need to do our best to, to try to enjoy it as much as we can hand the baton on to our children so that they can continue to make this place, make this planet a better place. But we should try to appreciate it as much as we can. So just the fact that we are here, the miracle that we are here, uh, I think is enough to be amazed. And look out the window once in a while. If you can, get outside, look around. Even if it's raining, we don't get rain in space. And that's a miracle too. I think we don't have breezes or temperature change. We have temperature changes, but not not the cool breeze or the warm sun that you feel when you're out there in a park. You don't, you feel it, but you feel it in a different way through your spaceship. So you don't get the, there's wondrous things that we have down here on the planet. And I think we need to be amazed every day and try to take that time out to, to realize how lucky we are to be here in the first place. Mm. That, that view of the earth from space, did it ever get old? No, it's mm. different every time. There's, you see things that are just extraordinary. The, the, the clouds, the, the storms, the thunderstorms at night, the stars in the sky that you see, the, it's the best planetarium I've ever been mm -hmm. in because you're above the atmosphere and all the stars are perfect points of light. Seeing the sun in a black sky, it doesn't get old. Um, but it does end. You only get to do that for a certain number of days. Even if you're my colleague Peggy Whitson who has 675 days in space. <laughs> that's a long time. But she, that's kind of small compared to how many days she's been alive, right? She's about my age, so she's been spending most of her time on the planet. I think what it truly does is allows you to engage the planet in a different way and with a different perspective and appreciation for what we have. And it also is a planet that we all share. My concept of home has changed. When I think of home, I used to think of my town of Franklin Square or, or New York or the United States as I got older, and I'll always be from those places, but I, th I think of myself now as a citizen of Earth. That's, that's where we're all from. It's a place we all share, and uh, I, th I think especially when we run into tough days, we should try to remember that, just how lucky we are just to be here. Mm. Two last questions. I, I realize the next one that I'm about to ask could be a very long answer, but- I'll try uh, to keep it short then. That's on me. Do you, uh, do you think we'll ever be multiplanetary, and do you think that's a good idea? Uh, like we'll live somewhere else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I like think Mars. so. I, well, I think, we'll, mm -hmm. I think Mars is a place for exploration. I, I think we can learn a lot about our solar system and about our planet going to Mars, 
Uh, it's not a trip to the Caribbean, though. You know, this is not like, uh, oh, this is a nicer place to go. You're not going to Disney World here. Right. It's going to be really interesting, but it's gonna, it's very inhos inhospitable there. Right. We can't. Do you see us terraforming it, like Elon's plan to bring a million people there and terraform? I don't know about a million. I think we'll start off with a couple at first, but I think eventually, I, I think the reason to go there is to study and to uh, to do things that will help our planet here. I don't think we're ever going to be leaving Earth. I think we have to. I think our exploration is really about preserving the Earth. If we can find energy source, sources other places, if we can understand how to better take care of our planet, if we can do some of the polluting somewhere else mm. and keep Earth as pristine as possible, the most unhospitable environment on planet Earth would be a paradise on Mars. It's 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 not an easy place to live. That's why we haven't been there yet with people. We haven't been back to the moon in 50 years. It's not so easy to live there either, but at least you're closer to home. If you have trouble, you can get back, and your communication is only about a second and a half. You can get help from the control center. But Mars is really far away, so I don't think it's going to be that easy. I do think we'll be there, uh, but I don't think we're ever going to give up this place. I mean, this place is a paradise, and I think we need to take better care of it, and I think going to Mars will allow us to do that, and exploring space will allow us to do that. But we're going to have to figure out a way to to uh, to live there, that's it's going to be pretty challenging. And speaking of visiting, that leads perfectly to my next question, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, Blue Origin, um, you know, all this, mm -hmm. all the SpaceX now that mm -hmm. we've got these private companies that may be going into space tourism. Do you see that as is that the next frontier? Is that the future? And is that something that appeals to you? Like for me to go as a tourist? No. Or, or for humans or, generally, for our society uh, generally. No, I, th I think it's I think it's perfectly fine. I, I don't think it's the the whole part of the future. I, I think it's you know people want to go to space to experience it and uh, and look out the window and look at the planet and float around a little bit. Or I think that that's I think that's great as a tourist location. Sure, um, I, I so I think people can still learn and experience it that way. I think that that's great. Um, but I also think that it's it's a, getting more people to space also leads to more research opportunities to learn about our planet. My, my students at Columbia have flown two experiments in space, and that's a result of the privatization. It, it opens up more opportunities. One of their experiments flew on a Blue Origin vehicle a couple of years ago, and more recently they flew an experiment up on a spa SpaceX uh, spacecraft to the space station. Mm -hmm. it was on the, sp the experiment was on the space station for a couple of months and then returned back to Earth for analysis. So uh, we're able, it was a biomedical experiment. So our, our Students, researchers, uh, entrepreneurs have more access to space, and I think what's great about the the commercialization of it that it's it's not just NASA going anymore; it's private citizens or companies or people with good ideas now can access space and use microgravity or whatever else, mining an asteroid or some process they want to try out on Mars, or that's going to that's further down the road or the moon. Maybe that's all open now and no we couldn't do that before it was just nasa going for reasons that a government would go for exploration and, and hopefully turning it over to the to private enterprise and that's what we're seeing now that a lot of, of a lot of space operations are being are being turned over to these commercial companies um so i think the tourism thing is kind of cool you're going to experience it bring that story home tell people about it share your pictures it's going to allow more people to go with a real purpose too, and, and I think tourism is a you know to experience that I think is a real purpose, but I think also in the areas of research or doing work, to go the route I took was not easy, right? It's it's not going to get any easier. It's still uh, year, years of getting trying to get in, and then you get there, and it's going to be years of training before you get to go. A lot of people don't have that much time, right? They they're they're involved whatever they're doing on the planet here, and maybe they want to try out a new manufacturing process, or maybe they want to. Tr try out some sort of new technology that can only be uh, made in space or whatever it is that they want to do, they now have the opportunities to do those things without having to spend 20 years to get there. They can, they can hopefully get a chance to go with relatively little training because these spaceships are highly automated to get there, do their stuff, and then come back and not have it as a career. I wanted to be part of that team. Um, and that's what I share in the book is the th lessons I learned that that helped me achieve my moonshot. But a lot of people, if they want to go to space and don't want to be a NASA astronaut, they can do that. Or if they want to try out their technology, there's, there's, there's different ways to do that now that were not available just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's, all of that is part of the future and the commercialization of it 
whether it's tourism or manufacturing or whatever, uh, making movies, who knows what people are going to be doing. I think that's where the future is. The first movie shot in space. The first movie shot right. in space. And you were, we never even talked about, you were, you're a TV <clears throat> star too. You Not were about the, a star. You, but you were on the Big Bang Theory. I was on the Big Bang Theory though, yeah. Like, <laughs> When, when NASA called you about it, they said, mm-hmm. uh, have you heard of the Big Bang Theory? Yeah. And I, at first I thought they were talking about the theory itself, you know, and, and like, no, the TV show. I go, yeah, of course I've heard of it. You know, uh, yeah, what about it? Uh, but yeah, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't very, I was familiar with the show, but, but I became more familiar with it and a uh, really great group of people. So, nice. yeah. Nice. Well, thank you for spending this time you with bet. us. Are Thanks, there Paula. any final lessons that you want to uh, impart to everyone listening about how they can take their moonshot? For me, becoming an astronaut seemed like an unreachable goal, and um, I don't, I don't know what the stereotypical astronaut is, but it's not what people think. I think in any regard of, we have this idea of what, uh, you know, a successful actress or actor or entrepreneur or astronaut might be and they're just regular people who don't give up and don't let failure stop them and and have a passion for something and work hard at it and uh and and surround themselves with a good team and are good teammates these are qualities i think that are important for success for anyone and i there was nothing special about me um i i learned these things some of them were i was driven i think by my passion to want to be a part of the space program. Um, and that was important to get me to that opportunity. And then these things I learned in, in teamwork and leadership and perseverance and dealing with mistakes and speaking up, this guidebook that, uh, that I've accumulated over those years, uh, I, I hope can be helpful to people. Because if I can do it, so can you. <laughs> it's no, that's what I want people to remember. There's nothing special about me or anyone else who's successful. Uh, there are things that we've learned along the way that helped, and uh, hopefully now these things are, in, at least in, from what I've learned, are available to you to help wh- whatever that moonshot is or developing that moonshot. Uh, I, I hope they keep that in mind, that, uh, that they can do it as well. Mm. Great. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, where can people find your book ah. uh, if they want <clears throat> to read it? It's available just about any place. Whatever you buy your book, the neighborhood bookstores are always good places to go to. Let's let's you know start there if you can. But uh, order on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatever book uh, seller you use. It's there. It's everywhere. Um, you can also go to my website, mikemassimino.com, if you want to get a hold of me. There's a way to do that. Uh, there's also a way to order the book there as well. That'll send you to different booksellers if you want to uh, if you want to go that route and. Uh, I also am active on social media. The first guy to tweet from space. And you were so the I do first it. guy to tweet from <clears> space? I was the first guy to tweet from space. Take that, Neil Armstrong. Wow. So there you go. I got that going for me. Uh, so you can follow me on social media as well. But the book is available everywhere. So uh, if you think it might be helpful, and I hope it will be helpful to you, uh, go pick up a copy. What, what was the first tweet from space? Uh, yeah, I, I, was, <laughs> I was given advice by Neil Armstrong not to think about because I asked him how he came up with what he said on the moon. And... He, you know, the one small step for mankind, one, one, yeah. one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And so when I first met him, I asked him how he came up with that. You know, did his, did his wife tell him to say that or whatever? And he said, he, he told me he didn't think about it until after he landed on the moon. Mm-hmm. And I was like, really? And I was a brand new astronaut. I met him my first week at NASA and he said, Mike, if, if I didn't land on the moon, there'd be no reason to say anything. I was worried about landing on the moon. I wasn't worried about what I was going to say. And then he said, you know, Mike, you got to, you can't, there's a lot of distractions in this, this world you've entered with this astronaut business and you're new to this, but you got to stick to your job first. Don't worry about that other stuff. Do your job and worry about that other stuff later. And I was like, okay. And when, so I was asked by the press on our last press conference, what I was going to tweet and I channeled Neil Armstrong and said, I'm not worried about that. We got to get to space first. I'll worry about that after we get there. So we get to space and I open up the computer. I'm ready to send this tweet. I hadn't thought about it and I couldn't think of a thing. And I, and I started thinking, he must have lied to me. There's no way this dude stepped on the moon and came up with that. I'm just floating around a couple hundred miles above the planet, and I can't think of anything. What I wanted to write, Paula, was curse you, Neil Armstrong. It's like, this guy lied to me. He set me up here. And so I just wrote, launch was awesome. The be- adventure of a lifetime has begun or something like that. So I sent that out on Monday. On Saturday, I got made fun of on Saturday Night Live. Seth Myers is doing Weekend Update. And I didn't know this. I found out about this later, but because I'm you know busy in space, right? But he says... Uh, 
We have the first tweet from space, Mike Massimino. Here it is. Launch was awesome. In 40 years, we've gone from one giant leap for mankind to launch was awesome. <laughs> so he let that one sit for a moment, like you're laughing here and what the audience was doing. Then he continues and says, I assume if we're ever to discover life in the universe, this is how we'll be notified. And it shows my little Twitter thing. And he says, it says, geez, dudes, aliens. Like that's how... <laughs> So that was that, and, uh, and I didn't know this was going on, but my kids were 13 and 15 at the time, and uh, so that was on Saturday. On Sunday, they go to school, uh, of course, you know, and, and I get email from them after school, and they sent me an email, and this is at the space walks are over, and I go over to see what they, uh, what they had to tell me, and this is how I found out about this Saturday Night Live, Then he said, Dad, they made fun of you on Saturday Night Live. All the kids at school loved it. Keep up the good work. You know, and I was like, okay, great. Finally, I was getting a little street cred here. Not for anything I did in space, but for the getting made fun of on Saturday Night Live. So, there you go. So you can find me on uh, Twitter, X, Instagram, Facebook as well, but the book's available anyway. Oh, well, thank you. Well, the you book bet. was awesome, and, and this thank interview you. was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. What three key takeaways did we get from this conversation? Number one, there are many misconceptions about what it takes for somebody to succeed. Often, we believe that what it takes for someone to succeed is some type of innate characteristic or ability. We think that people are naturally gifted, naturally talented, born brilliant. In reality, Mike shares with us that what it takes to succeed is persistence, grit, doggedness, tenacity. It, it requires not giving up. But you don't necessarily have to be the smartest kid in class. In fact, your fourth grade teacher might have thought you were kind of average. Anything you're trying to do that's new, if you're trying to learn something, if you're trying to do something with your family, if you're trying to accomplish something as a parent or something at work, mm. if it's something that's challenging, mm. don't expect it to be easy. You know, there's a reason why things are hard. Not everybody does them, and uh, not everybody can do everything. And people that do, it's not like they're super talented, but they just stick to it, and they they try to try to forge on when, when they get hit with difficulties. You know, success, successful people are not those that don't fail. They're, they are those that don't let failure stop them. After all, if you never try, your chances are zero. If you try, your chances are greater than zero. They may not be great, but they are at least better than zero. One out of a million is a non-zero outcome. As soon as you give up, that becomes zero. Key takeaway number two. Mike shares the story of how not speaking up, even though he was the rookie, not speaking up nearly cost him his life. Now, most of us are not going to face consequences that dire when we fail to speak up, but it doesn't change the fact that failing to speak up, failing to advocate for yourself or for an idea, for something that you believe is in the best interest of your team, your organization, your mission, failing to speak up has consequences and everyone even rookies should pipe up when they see something or when they sense that something is wrong a lot of times when you're in new, new at something or you're and you're especially when you work with someone who's very experienced we tend to not say anything mm -hmm. and it's okay if you're doing that to learn but it's important for you to say things when you're the new person and we were always encouraged to speak up because you're not kind of sucked into the usual way of doing things and your antenna, your antenna might be up a little bit more. And that goes for a new idea, something that might be a problem, identifying it with a different perspective. That is the second key takeaway. Finally, key takeaway number three. There are times when we are tempted to let our failures or setbacks derail us. Mike walks us through how to deal with a disappointment without letting it derail us. When you do make a mistake, uh, it's okay to be disappointed in yourself, but you have to cap it. Give yourself 30 seconds of regret, beat yourself up internally. Man, that was the dumbest mistake I've ever made. I can't believe I've done, I'm the stupidest astronaut ever. 
or whatever it might be, and after 30 seconds, let it go and move on and, and don't repeat that mistake. Try not to repeat it, but, but leave it in the past and move forward. Don't dwell on it because if you dwell on your mistakes, you're, just, you're, just in, you're living in misery and you're, you're not going to be a, a functioning person. At least that's the way I was. Before I learned how to deal with my mistakes, I would ruminate over them, mm. sometimes for days. Oh, I can't believe I did that. When I fell my qualifying exam, it was like a week of misery. You know, more was me. That's not helpful. That week goes by, you don't get those days back in life. They're gone. So you need to figure out a way to leave it in the past. But I do think it's okay to be mad at yourself. Those are three key takeaways from this conversation with NASA astronaut Mike Massimino, who was also on the Big Bang Theory. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been one of the most special episodes that we have created ever. Those of you who are listening to this through audio, please go to our YouTube channel and watch this one. It is absolutely incredible to watch. Mike is so wonderful. So absolutely wonderful. So youtube.com slash afford anything. And for those of you who are on YouTube right now, hello, hi, please drop a comment below. Let us know what you thought. I'll be reading every single one of these. Thank you so much for being part of the Afford Anything community. Make sure that you are subscribed to this podcast on YouTube. Make sure that you are subscribed to the show notes, which you can get for free by going to affordanything.com slash show notes. And most importantly, share this with a friend, share it with a neighbor, a colleague, a family member, with someone you love, someone you kind of like, someone you sort of tolerate, someone you dislike. Share it with everybody because that is how we spread these positive, uplifting messages of how you can take your moonshot. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is the Afford Anything Podcast. My name is Paula Pant, and I will catch you in the next episode.